Good afternoon, my friends. This is the Grim Flayer. Hope you're all doing very well today. It is a gloomy and windswept and chilly day here for me, and we've got some grim tidings that fit the day, but maybe these are joyous tidings for many of you out there. We've got a big change to the companion mechanic. We have a nerf, in fact, to the companion mechanic, and I'm here at the request of my viewership to talk about it. So uh, still no upgraded audio. My apologies for this segment. That is in the works, but for now, you've got to deal with what we've got. I hope, it's, uh, I hope it's audible for you, and without further ado, we're going to talk about the companion mechanic in a vacuum. We're also going to talk about, of course, what it means for the BGX family in Modern. Let's get into it. New companion rule is as follows. Once per game, anytime you could cast a sorcery during your main phase when the stack is empty, you can pay three generic mana to put your companion from your sideboard into your hand, this is a special action, not an activated ability. So if you didn't know, now you know. But basically, my friends, we have been bamboozled. Um, at least I was and, and many others were. So the companion mechanic, of course, you've got a lot of consistency and a lot of power baked into having a card that's guaranteed to be, that you have guaranteed access to, right? At the beginning of every single game. And you you do have that consistency and that's a very powerful thing but you could argue that that consistency is balanced out by the downside of having to build around it so you can argue sure the consistency of the build around is mitigated by the limitations of the build around right that if it's well designed which you know obviously we could argue that um if it's well designed that is kind of something that naturally keeps itself in check but the outlying factor the, out, the big outlier here, the big egregious um, thing that in many ways put Companion over the top is that it was a free eighth card that was nominally in the opening hand, although actually it's even better than being in the opening hand because it's in the Companion zone, right? So the eighth card is what put it over the top um, when otherwise it might have been balanced. Therefore, many people, myself included, speculated that the most obvious fix and the most likely fix would be for them to essentially have the Companion take the place of the seventh card or the seventh minus n n being the number times of of mulligan's card and this was kind of the the expected outcome we don't have it we don't have it so that is a bit of a surprise it's an interesting surprise and i would argue that it's actually kind of intriguing um from just from an evaluating the design and evaluating the curation of the format perspective because it now puts Companion in this really interesting place where this is still, despite the nerf and despite the existing limitations of Companions, this is still a way to get that guaranteed card advantage. A lot of people, guys, the, in the first reactions I saw to this are people saying, oh, well, there goes Companion. Good, it's gone. Or, oh, there goes Companion. Why did they nerf it so hard it's now unplayable? I would caution against this. I would advise, you know, to uh, take a more moderate approach to this, right? Because this is still a way to get a guaranteed eight-card start. You just have to build around it. And yes, it is now, you now have to take the tempo hit in order to actually put that eighth card to use for you. So don't get me wrong. This is a big nerf. This is a good old body blow to Companion, and many would say it is well-deserved. And uh, many would say we should have gone even further. But I do have to say that the mere fact that the eighth card is guaranteed means do not, do not count Companion out yet. Companion is down, but it may well not be out. Let's talk a little bit about where and how that might manifest. All right, guys. So long story short with that is basically I think the further you had to go out of your way to build around Companion or the more you had to warp your deck around it, the less likely you are to still want to do so after this nerf. On the opposite end of the spectrum, the more of a free roll inclusion companion was, the likelier you are to still want to free roll include it. So what are some examples of this? Well, let's look at the Gigantha decks. Let's look at decks like Storm and Humans and Tron. And hey, make no mistake, I don't play any of these decks. I know that there has been some speculation as to whether it was even worth including the companion under the old rules, right? Not everybody included this free roll vanilla 5-5 five, five for 5 all of the time. So I understand that, and I'm not making any expertise-based judgments here, but what I'm saying is that if you really think about it, 
even though it is now a worse 5-5, because you now have to pay 8 mana for that free 5-5, the free 8th card, um, even though you can break it up over two turns, it is still, the incentive kind of really hasn't changed if you think about it. Basically, the idea there is it's not really a synergistic piece in those decks. It is just the access to an 8th card is better than a 15th sideboard card if you want to register it, and that is still basically true. It's much slower, don't get me wrong, but it was already an attrition piece in those decks. It was already a piece where people are saying, okay, I'm just going to always have access to this, and if the game goes long, and if I have nothing better to do, I can just play it for free. That is still true. That is still true. Um, a more perhaps impactful example of this would be Lurus in decks like Burn and Bogle. So there are kind of three stages here. Number one is the, like, red-black prowess deck that is really built around Lurus and plays the full playset of Mishra's Bobble. That is something that I don't think we're going to see anymore. I think that everything from, like, classic burn just tacking Lurus on the end of it to classic mono-red prowess with no companion at all playing Bedlam Reveler to other decks that maybe still want to leverage Lurus and Bobble, but they want to get grindier to really make sure that Lurus gets online. I think any one of those directions is going to prove more powerful than the kind of conglomeration of all of those things in the form of a red-black Lurus prowess Bobble deck. I don't think that's any longer viable, but, you know, for those who are not building around Lurus that heavily, for those who are not even playing Mishra's Bobble, you know, like a Bogle's deck, or like a Burn deck that literally just has B uh, as Lurus, seeing the free 8th card better on average than the 15th sideboard card, it's just your second wave of attack, I think that's still good. I honestly think that's still good. Again, it is just a free roll inclusion. They're not having to trim any permanents from the main deck that they would otherwise want to play. And for that reason alone, I think that's going to still be a viable um, thing to do in modern. So again, companion down but not out, certainly in that regard. And beyond that, you know, I hate to say it because I really wish it wasn't true. But I honestly kind of think that Yorian is not as nerfed as many people think it is. The Yorian decks already really want to go long. The Yorian decks already really want to make a million land drops. And yes, they are going to lose some percentage points by not being able to play Yorian on turn 5. A lot of the more controlling decks that want to interact and survive until the late game where their inevitability takes over um, you might have seen this in my recent Yorian Sultai video, my first time ever playing the card myself. There were a few times where I interacted and I made my uh, Astrolabe and Abundant Growth drops, and then on turn 5 I just slammed Yorian. And Yorian, as a big 4-5 flyer, extended the game, drew me like 2 or 3 cards while also himself being a free 8th card, and then I was able to, take, to bridge into the late game very easily on the back of that. So don't get me wrong, we no longer have access to that on Yorian decks, but otherwise, again, kind of in the, at the opposite end of the spectrum from the burn decks, I don't know that their incentives have changed all that much. I think you might still see a surprising amount of Yorian play. I could be wrong about that, but this free eighth card that draws a lot of cards on ETB and naturally synergizes with a lot of extraordinarily powerful cards like Astrolabe and Quattel and Uro that are already in the colors. I don't know, guys, we might still be seeing a fair amount of Yorian, but uh, where I do think that the um, upside of playing a companion really falls off a cliff is for the decks that had to go out of their way to build around it, and that is where we come to the BGX family. That is where Jund, Rock, Abs, and Sultai uh, traditional black-based mid-range decks, this is where we no longer have the incentive, in my opinion, quite anywhere near as much as we once did. So when you're a mid-range player, you've got to be able to roll the punches. You have got to be, uh, you've got to adopt the beatdown roll if the matchup calls for it and if your cards line up in such a way that allows you to. Conversely, you've got to adopt the control roll if the circumstances call for it. Luris with Mishra's Bobble, in a low-curve Jundarok deck, allowed us to do this, because if we're playing a control role, 
and we need to get a threat down in order to get some presence on the board to clog up what the opponent is doing or to just stabilize or indeed to start clocking while also getting value, Luris could do that for you at no cost, basically. But conversely, if you wanted to just keep playing your cards from hand, Luris would be very happy to wait in the wings and take over the game in the late game when the time is right, when the moment was opportune. Now, with having to pay three mana to bring Luris to your hand, you no longer have the opportunity to get a body down and get the bobble loop going sometimes right away on curve on turn three. And that is a huge loss for any Luris deck. But again, the Luris decks that were just kind of free rolling him, they don't care because they were only doing that if they had nothing better to do anyway. But for a deck like Jund or Rock or Absin that needs to adapt to the situation, this is a big, big blow. I really want you to understand that the flexibility provided by Luris is no longer available to us. We now have to rely on always getting to the late game if we want to make Luris a factor. And I don't think that's necessarily viable for mid-range. Therefore, I think the incentive to play Luris has kind of cratered. And therefore, we should be looking at the traditional versions of BGX now. And I know a lot of you are going to ask me about this, so I'm going to make this part of the video. Which is going to be the best, best variant right out of the gates once this change takes effect? Well, in my view, it is going to be Jund. Why Jund, you say? Why Jund? Well, if you look at the meta from pre-Ikoria before Companion took everything over, there is a lot of big mana, guys. There is a lot of big mana. And the big mana decks, unfortunately, they still have access to Veil of Summer. Jund, red sideboard cards never used to really mean much, but these days they're actually super impactful. Pillage, or Stone Rain if you want to be easier on your mana, or even Molten Rain if you value the added clock. These are all cards that serve the purpose of a Stone Rain, serve the purpose of a Fulminator Mage, serve the purpose of Blow Up a Land, which... So what we need to do to beat big mana decks a lot of the time, and they don't get blown out by Veil of Summer. That is really huge. I can't say how huge it is. Also, I mentioned that I think Yorian is still going to see play. Imagine how hard it was in the pre aquaria meta on a normal BGX deck, let's say BG Rock, to try to outgrind the Astrolabe, Quattel, etc. snow piles that are highly value generating. Now imagine them having access to Yorian. It was hard before, it's going to be really, really hard with Yorian. Even if they don't have Yorian, these are still going to be one of the decks to beat, still going to be one of the harder mid-range decks to beat for sure for us. The big appeals to Jund are that number one, the top end of Jund with Bloodbraid Elf specifically, but also when you can reach for cards like Season Pyromancer, Huntmaster of the Fells, Jund is probably better than any other deck uh, in the BGX family, better able, better equipped to keep up with the value generation of the snow piles. Jund can disrupt with a lot of two-for-ones, things like Coligan's Command. It's got a good aggressive clock. You can just windmill slam a Bloodbraid Elf into known permission and still get some kind of a good outcome. And on top of all that, Jund has Boil. Boil is the anti-island card, the anti-astrolabe card par excellence. Boyle is the card that is the big I win button against these decks, and in my view, they are going to be some of the biggest decks to beat. To add to all that, there is also the principle that you can never go too far wrong with, that is, in an unknown meta where there is a big change and a lot of moving pieces, you want to do something as proactive as possible, and it is a very proactive thing to do to play Jund relative to slower BGX decks, because... When all else fails, if your interaction is not guaranteed to line up because your uh, 75 might not be perfectly tuned for the meta, you can go fast. You can go upstairs with your bolts. You've got haste threats like Blood Braid Elf. Uh, you've got other forms of reach. It's just, it's just a proactive thing to do. It's just a good place to be. Now, I bet many of you are wondering, is it worth playing Luris in BGX main decks? Forget about Companion. Is he just a good three mana value piece? Um, to that I would say maybe, I think it's at least viable, I think it's at least worth trying, but the less you build around him, the less valuable he is. And specifically in Jund, I think we've got three mana permanents that are, three and four mana, mana permanents that are going to be very, very difficult to displace. I don't think it's going to be crazy to play Luris in Jund, I don't think it's beyond the pale, but I also, 
I think on average I'm rating cards like Season Pyromancer and Bloodbraid Elf more highly than it, again, assuming you're not going to build around it, which you really shouldn't if it's not your companion. But, couple different factors here. So number one, some of you might be still saying, I want to play Luris in the main deck. Number two, some of you might still be saying, I want to play Luris as a companion. I really like the Luris companion um, setup. I really like the low curve. I really like Mishra's Bobble. And number three, some of you might be saying, oh, I don't want to feel priced into playing Jund. I really love two colors. I really love classic green, black rock. Well, I think that if is there is a way to play the rock optimally, and if there is a way to play Luris optimally, I think you see where I'm going with this? Do you see where I'm getting at? I think these two interests are coinciding. I think BG the Rock might be the best shell for Luris, both as a companion and as a main deck card, at least in the BGX family. And conversely, I think including Luris in some way, shape, or form might be the extra juice needed to bring Rock to the top. So Rock by nature wants to play more low curve permanence than the three color decks like Jundarabs and Ursultai do. Why? Well, a big attraction to the third color is the increased breadth and the increased power and diversity of the interaction. Jund is an obvious example. You're talking about Lightning Bolt, talking about Coligan's Command, you're talking about even cards like Terminate when they're good in the meta. I mentioned some of the sideboard tech. These are all cards that to some degree come at the expense of green black rock threats because there are only so many trophies and decays and pulses you can play in a green black rock deck before you start reaching diminishing returns and you start needing to do other things than one for one anything that, that moves right so therefore rock decks tend to pack more threats not only because they don't have as much interaction to choose from but also because many of the low curve threats are actually better in rock than they are in jundarabs and like scavenging ooze this is a better card in rock because Rock makes more plentiful green mana and it's less painful. Scavenging Ooze is better in the Rock than it is in the three color decks. Dark Confidant is better in the Rock than it is in the three color decks because you have more painless mana, Bob is less of a liability. Do you see how this is all coming together? Rock already wants you to play more low curve permanence, which of course is good synergy with Luris, whether Luris is your companion or whether Luris is in your main deck. That is up to you and you can definitely explore doing it both ways but if you want to keep my baubles around if you want to keep main decking Nile Spellbomb which is actually something that I think was undervalued in the past even before Companion made it kind of mandatory these are all things that BG the Rock is a great shell for so that is my take on that if you want to keep doing something besides play Classic Jund, again, whether it be Luris main deck, whether it be Luris companion, or whether it be playing just two-color mid-range, consider this. Consider what I just said. And as always, guys, you can let me know if you disagree, or of course, if you agree, I would love to hear it. All right, guys, well, I'm starting to get rained out here. I'm going to have to call it, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy with the update. I'm happy they didn't take too soft of a measure. We needed something significant. I think this is going to be significant. And even though I personally would be happy to just see Companion banned, I, if I want to be objective, with every new mechanic, we should try to make it work. We should try to make it viable, but not mandatory. This nerf, uh, the, the tempo loss in exchange for card advantage, that's basically how we should be perceiving the inclusion of a companion right now. Uh, this has the potential at least to hit the mark and, and make companions a feature of modern that is welcome and that is interesting and that is not overpowered. So we'll see how it all goes. Uh, this video for the patrons out there, is taking the place of my June scouting report at the request of people in my Discord. And uh, as always, if you like it, please do leave a thumbs up. Please do leave your comments below. And uh, yeah, I hope you did. So I look forward to hearing your thoughts and I look forward to playing some good old fashioned Jund and other forms of mid range. Definitely want to give abs in a spin. Definitely want to dig into Rock a little bit more and see exactly what the best way to go forward with Rock is in the weeks and months to come. You can find all that happening right here on this channel. So thank you so much for watching. Hope the audio was loud enough for you to hear, and I will talk to you next time. Everybody out there, world is getting pretty crazy right now, so please do stay safe and uh, be well. I will talk to you soon, and hope everybody out there has a wonderful day.